hello friends and hello matrix uh, welcome to another video and let's continue with our paper one from these recent exams uh, just for those who may be wondering uh, this is the supplementary paper which was the national paper all right so that is the paper was written all over South Africa and this was written by those who probably wanted better marks which they couldn't get in the past November exams or those who were upgrading otherwise your June exams for the class of 2022 I think those papers are provincial papers so they may be different from one province to another in any case um, because this is just mathematics for me I know that uh, most of your educators or whoever are the provincial bodies that conduct your exams or at least set your exams are aware of what was out in May, June supplementary exams. So you may have some striking similarities in terms of the questions. It may not necessarily be the same thing, but I believe the concepts would not truly be that different. So, in any case, this is again a form of revision and we know that these papers, the supplementary papers, are not really that easy. Okay, not to say they are difficult, but they are not that easy. So, it's a bit of a walk. Okay, let's see if indeed that is the case here. Alright, so just... Um, before we move on, I remember there was that velocity time graph for question, let's have a look, what is this question again? So, um, this one, what was this one? Question three, okay? So that velocity time graph, I mean, I think trying to do it on scale here didn't really do me so much justice because I mean this portion right here is very difficult to visualize so I kind of redrew it without really paying too much attention to the scale but making sure that you can have a bit of a, a show there so that is what it should look like you should actually see this graph going down to the negative side so that you can appreciate that and then of course the area under the curve gives you the displacement but for this green graph you know that you have that 30 meters to add to this so you will find that when you calculate the area under the graph you get 11 okay which is the time it took to reach the maximum height um, did I say time the distance or the displacement but to that you add the 30 but because the ball be started from the ground so it captures the whole displacement or distance okay so that is just that correction or at least a better view than I showed earlier okay nonetheless we move on so we've done all of these ones so we're starting with question six so I'd rather we move and not really spend too much time talking a hey, come back where are you going? Alright, let's see what's the story about question 6. The story says a car moves at a constant speed of 10 meters per second okay, towards a stationary source. So Now these things are very important because when you're talking about a sound source, it's stationary. The observer or listener is moving. Okay. Now it says the sound source emits sound waves. The source it emits sound waves of frequency 880 hertz. Okay. Now it says the sound detector A, that is that sound detector over there, is attached to the car. And another sound detector B, that one there, is attached to the source. Okay. Now it says detector B, which is this one detects the sound waves reflected from the car so meaning it emits sound waves 
this one detects it but some of them are reflected back and then this one reads them back so they're sort of like working as partners they're handing each other the ball all right now we are told uh, the speed of sound in air is 340 meters per second okay again we can tell you that we're dealing with doppler effect okay so it says now state the doppler effect in words okay so uh, this one again this is just an easy two marks you have to just take it uh, let's try let's not be lazy let's just do it um, please my thingy don't do it let's just move this one up a little bit just a little bit so that was d b e may june 2022 physics paper one okay i'm just going to try and be silly about this one so we're continuing with doing question six so we had a bit of a very long power cut an entire day so i couldn't do a single thing so that's why this one is this late otherwise i wished you could have had it by you know early evening last night but hey you're gonna have it today at least i hope okay so now 6.1 what do we want here doppler effect so what is the doppler effect so it says stated in words all right so what do we know there is some sort of an apparent change of the frequency okay or you can say it's a perceived change in frequency of sound uh, caused by either okay the listener or the source all right um, due to their relative movement movement or so uh, in relation to each other so let's just put it in nice words and say it is a perceived it's a perceived change okay in frequency yeah my writing guys is gonna kill you so think listen more than you, you you try and read okay perceived frequency of sound but i'm gonna try to be a bit calm when i'm calm i write better so it is a perceived change in frequency of sound okay caused by either the listener or source remember this perceived or apparent change in frequency is caused by either the listener or the source okay moving moving relative to each other all right so i mean there's many things you can say i mean this is not exactly exhaust as exhaustive as possible but i mean it captures what is important because here it's a perceived change meaning it's a perception it's not exactly a true change but it it is what appears to change okay perceived change in the frequency of sound caused by either the listener source moving relative to each other so there has to be some movement that is related in this so in easy two marks again guys this is where you just take and move okay you don't want to be caught out by these things so please drill definitions so that you don't lose marks on these ones okay now the next question says um calculate the wavelength of the sound waves emitted by the source okay so this is easy because we know that well in terms of waves c sometimes they say c or v doesn't really matter equals the frequency multiplied by 
the wavelength which is that lambda sign okay so they're saying the wavelength of the sound waves emitted by the source so this implies what when we make our lambda the subject of the formula this is what we end up with okay and then we are told here the speed of sound is 340 meters per second divide by the frequency of the source which was 880 hertz okay let's just read my calculator so let's quickly handle this one so 340 um, divide by 880 so I get this number here well again you can make three decimal places if you like but minimum is two okay so don't do less than two okay so we're just going to do three here at least to be on the safe side is zero comma three eight six uh, but again they said minimum isn't it not just maximum two but said minimum two unless otherwise stated so that is fine so this is 0 comma 386 or 39 if you want to make it to two decimal places meters remember this is a distance so is in meters easy 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 stuff so again they asked a very simplistic grade 10 question so to speak I mean this is grade 10 work to be honest um, so for the formula I don't know I mean this making the lambda the subject of the formula is not that impressive but correct substitution and the answer gives us the three marks that they are offering all right the next one says calculate the frequency of the sound waves detected by detector A so that is the frequency of the listener okay easy again so we know we're just going to simply say the frequency of the listener equals the velocity of uh, okay maybe let's use V here I think to use C it's like we're talking about light I think C is the speed of light so let's not use C there it's, it's a bit dangerous think for waves of sound we're talking about V okay yeah 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 V plus or minus what the velocity of the listener over the velocity of sound plus or minus the velocity of the source all of that multiplied by the frequency of the source I think that's how the equation is written so let's check and be sure sometimes when you don't remember things don't force your memory just take it easy you have an information sheet over there so it looks all right okay not a problem not a problem so what do we do now um, so all we do this implies that our frequency of the listener is going to be equal to what is the velocity of sound is 340 again need to cram this one sometimes they may not give it to you okay now remember the source is moving I mean the listener is moving towards the source so the sign becomes a plus and what was the velocity of the listener it was 10 meters per second over here this is stationary so in essence that falls away we just have 340 here that's all we have because the rest is zero so in essence you could easily say if you're moving towards you will simply um, say add for the denominator but you're going to add zero so there's no need to show that because it's a bit of a situation you know then what was the frequency of the listener it was 800 and, I mean of the source it was 880 so let's do that it's very easy uh, so 340 plus 10 is 350 
divide by 340 times 880. So I got a very big number here. So uh, this is 905, comma, let's just do two decimal places because the other one is insignificant. Heads, okay. So remember, frequency is measured in hertz. Okay, which means just cycles per second, of course. Um, now let's see what is the story about this one. Of course, I think the formula is correct. I think the correct substitution and maybe that sign matters. And then, of course, the answer. So we're getting the four marks, okay? So no need to struggle here. So now we are told the sketch graph below shows the frequency recorded by detector A. Okay. Now we can see that it's a constant frequency that it hears, all right? Now we are told to redraw the graph above for detector A. Uh, for detector A in your answer book. So meaning you, you redraw this. On the same set of axes, sketch the graph of the frequency recorded by detector B. Label this graph as B. Now all I know is since the source is moving towards, because remember now this will appear as the source because all the reflected waves is going to be more or less the same frequency. But because this one is reflecting it while it's moving towards the listener in this case, then the listener will hear more compressions arriving per second than actually is reflected. So this one will definitely be higher. So I hope I'm not wrong about this one, but ugh, this one is one of those simple ones. So uh, if this is what my B is <laughs> okay so let's just I'm not gonna draw this I'm just gonna draw it over here so let's just use a nice color so now all I know is B will hear a frequency higher than the one reflected on A so I mean I think that is what makes a bit of sense to say so here they didn't really care about measurements. So I would assume that is what would happen. But again, double check this. I am not exactly sure if my thinking is correct, but based on what the Doppler effect describes, this is what should be the case, okay? But I could be wrong here. But I doubt if it would be smaller because when the source now because remember when this one reads the reflected waves this one is now the source and it's moving towards so this one will hear more compressions arriving than the frequency that is actually reflected so in essence it should be higher than what A was hearing because now this is a bit of a different story but it's a bit of a challenging question I can tell you so this is why some of these questions are not the easiest because even the smallest areas can cause a bit of a problem. Anyway, we welcome those problems because we want to solve them. So I would assume uh, this is where you would get your two marks by showing this one above that. I just hope I'm correct. Okay? I'm not too sure. So please check when those memorandums come out and be sure to get it right and then of course try to understand why it is so but I think it makes a bit of sense for it to look like this although it may sound to make sense it may not necessarily be correct so yeah let's keep moving I can't stay there because even if we get it wrong staying there won't change it isn't it okay let's do question seven quickly Question 7 is electrostatics. Again, a very nice chapter. An area to really take as many marks as possible. Now it says uh, 
two small identical spheres. Now, what do they mean when they say identical? So it means they carry the same amount of charge. They're of the same mass, you know. Yeah, let's just think of those two things. And of course, the charges may not necessarily be of the same sign, meaning they can be oppositely charged, but they carry same amount of charge. All right, um, P and T are placed a distance R apart, as shown in the diagram. So you can see everything is nicely drawn there. Then now it says P carries a charge of plus 3 microcoulombs, okay? And T carries a charge of minus 3 microcoulombs, all right? Not a problem. So that makes life easy for us. Now it says state Coulomb's law again. This question is very famous. Please don't get it wrong. I beg you. If you read these things and you read them again and again and you try as many questions on these, you will see that they are actually fairly easy because you don't have much to think about. You just do. Hey, I'm feeling sleepy though, guys. It's very late, you know. Um, question 7. So we're starting with 7.1. Well, Coulomb's law, you know, it's all about uh, the force, the electrostatic force between two point charges. Uh, let's do it. Electrostatic force between two point charges is directly proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Ah, I call. Why did I even waste my time writing? Because I don't think you guys can see this. Okay, the electrostatic force between two point charges is directly proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So, I mean, this is simply what is in your textbooks, study guides, whatever. So please get it right. But the idea here is that F is basically something like this so this is the story that you're saying that this force is directly proportional to the product of the charges but is inversely proportional to the square of the distance okay that means for this to have a direct proportion you have to divide we have to take the inverse of that, all right? Not a problem. Easy stuff. That was 7.1.1. Yay, when? Okay. 7.1.2. Okay, let me try to calm down a bit because my writing is fading. Hey, but tiredness is killing me. It says now draw the resultant electric field pattern due to the charges on P and T. Okay. Very nice question. So let's see, we have this charge P here. We know it's positive, right? Okay. And then we have this charge here, T, which is negative. Okay. So all we know is that ah, the electric field lines see now maybe let's write this P over here so these things are going to try and do something like that they will do something like that okay I'm trying to draw an onion <laughs> ah my lord 
if my position was the best though so let's do something nice man so that it looks all right uh, all right all right so we know this is t over here that was p over there okay so what do we know electric field lines go towards the negative charge so these field lines are going to come from the positive towards the negative charge okay all right so they leave the positive charge but they come in on the negative charge all right so this is something like that that you would get so you would get three marks i guess for showing the field lines and stuff i don't know what else is there okay so we are happy with that so let's see what is the next one it says now a third charge sorry a third charged sphere s of unknown charge okay the charge is unknown qs okay is placed a distance of 0 comma 1 5 meters from a sphere t such that the three charges sorry are at the vertices of a right angled triangle see they're giving you a clue that the angle between these two is 90 degrees okay so that is what they're telling us okay great and then it says now okay their net electrostatic force now remember when you hear that word net or resultant um, on sphere t due to the two other charged spheres has a magnitude of 10 newtons as shown in the diagram so do you see it goes like that and then of course um, if we were to just try and be silly here remember when we do force diagrams um, we have to do the tail to head method so to speak so you have to extend this because they made it shorter so that you don't see what is going on so you just shift one of them to create a triangle all right So you want something like that. All right, so basically this is the story. So that means whatever was the angle is going to be this angle over here still. Okay, so do you see that is the story that is being projected? And then of course the direction of this force doesn't change. It's like that. So you know here that when you have two areas that are at an angle and the resultant forces like that it's pretty much what we call the parallelogram method so that means you shift one to the other doesn't really matter where you can even shift this one to that side so that this one can come on like that it's up to you really so all I know is if these two are oppositely charged the electrostatic force on T by P is directed towards P so do you see and obviously if this is what we call a, a tail to head method it means this arrow should be going that way isn't it because it goes there goes there and then the resultant always meets head to head with the last one so if the electrostatic force now is directed that way then it means this charge is positively charged because remember T is negatively charged okay that's great not a problem so the question says is charge QS a positive charge or negative the answer is positive because then for our resultant to look like that it means um, this the force of S on T is directed to the right. Okay, 
Now, big question says, calculate the number of electrons added or removed. So they don't want to tell you exactly because in any case, if this is a positive charge, it means it lost electrons, right? So they were removed in essence. Because remember, a sphere is neutral. But once you charge it, you either remove or add electrons, okay? So let's see how many electrons there are. So what is the key here? What is key is finding that force, okay? Because we're going to be dealing with forces. We know the resultant. So we know the two charges. We know the distance between them. So we can use our Coulomb's law to find that. And from there, this is a right angled triangle. So we also need that. Because once we find that, remember this is the one between these two. So if we find this force from our force diagram, we can then use this distance to calculate the charge on S, okay? And then from that charge of S, we divide by the charge on an electron. Then it will give us the number of electrons there. Okay, great. Bit of a... A situation there to work with so let's first find the electrostatic force between P and T so I'm just going to call it F P T okay and then I'm going to also look for F T S okay or S T all right so first off let's look for that one ah, where's my ruler So we are dealing with 7.1.3. We said this is a positive, positive charge. Okay, it's positive. Okay, let's just stop that. It didn't say explain. 7.1.4. So what we want is the electrostatic force between P and T. It's going to be K. QP multiplied by QT over R squared, okay? This is 9 times 10 to the 9. So know there's constants by heart sometimes, it helps. Then what is the charge on P? It's plus 3 microcoulombs multiplied by minus 3 microcoulombs all over this is 0, 0,1 squared. All right, so this one is going to be negative, right? Because it's attraction. Because they will attract, okay? When it's positive, it's repulsion. So let's see what is the story here. 9 to the 9 uh, into 3 to the minus 6 into minus 3 to the minus 6 over 0, 0,1 squared. I'm just trying to sort out this number on the calculator so that it does not mess with me because it wants to do something like that and I will not allow it so I'm getting a negative force of 8,1 so we can just say 8,1 Newtons attraction because it was negative or you can just write it as negative it's fine so this is one step then we can say uh, now we can simply say uh, I don't know what can we call this one what can we call this one so let's see so this implies what? That um, 
the force uh, Ts squared plus the force Pt squared is going to be equal to the net force. So we can say is going to be equal to F net squared, okay? So this is Pythagoras. Pythagoras, okay, let's just say Python and stop it there. Now, if we're going to do this, then we know we're looking for this force. This means that our force Ts squared is going to be equal to our net force squared minus uh, that force uh, Pt squared, okay? So, therefore, our Fts is going to be equal to the square root of this one. So, let's do this one. What was the net force? It was 10 squared minus. What is this force Pt? We calculated minus 8,1 squared, okay? Now the problem. Um, remember this square root sign says plus or minus. So all we know is that this force is an attraction force. So it should be seen as a negative, okay? It works best that way. So we'll choose the negative one. Or you can just say attraction as well. So let's see what do we get, okay? Hey. Yeah, the tightness is really getting to me, you know. I will go and see Johnny. Ah, Katala so. Ah, man, you're born again. Oh, I'm about to go to Villa. Oh, this is coma. Yo, I can go see your Nagal. So get more shake again, man. But remember, we're not going to round off too much here. So let's just take as many as we can here. So we're going to get here 5,864 newtons. Again, this is attraction. If you're wondering what should be the sign, it should be negative, right? Because we established that that was a positive charge. So the force between the two would be that of attraction again the mere effect of a square root sign it says plus or minus so we'll just take the negative one instead of the positive one okay now the problem so from here what do we do let's just do it over here so that we don't find ourselves too far away now we know that well this f Ts is equal to what? K Qt multiplied by Qs over R squared. Okay. Now this force is an attraction force, so this is minus five comma eight six four equals nine to the nine. This is ten to the nine. Okay. I don't know why it looks ugly like that. And then this charge is minus 3 microcoulombs multiplied by that Qs, which I want. Okay. All over the distance between them is 0, 0,15. And then we square that. Okay. So what does it tell me? It tells me that my Qs is going to be equal to, just cross multiply that. This is over 1, isn't it? So we're going to have here minus 5,864 into 0, 0,15 squared. All of that divide by that product here. 9 to the 9 into, okay, maybe let's put a bracket over there. And also this one into minus 3 micro columns. So it's a bit of a long one. Again, these are the questions designed to really cause trouble. So do not allow them to catch you. So we have minus 5,864 
Um, uh, into zero comma one five squared. Close our bracket, and then we have here nine to the minus to the nine. Sorry. Uh, multiplied by minus three microcoulombs. All right, the amount of charge because we just want the charge here. So I get here four comma. Again here you can see it's a very long thing, so we can do this one two three decimal places at least. So it's going to be four comma eight eight. 7 times 10 uh -huh, times 10 to the minus 6 so you can see this is micro columns it makes a bit of sense right yes so that is the charge we are getting therefore the number of electrons is going to be charge divided by charge on an electron isn't it which is going to be 4,887 microcoulombs divide by the charge on an electron this is 1,6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs so the coulombs take each other out yeah. now let's see what was that is it correct let me be sure you know sometimes it's easy to not remember these things right so don't take a chance yeah so remember, I really don't have to worry about the sign at this point. When I want the number of electrons, that's just a scalar quantity. It doesn't really mean much. So I'm going to have 4,887 to the minus 6 divided by 1,6 to the minus 19. And this gives me this number here. So I get 3,0. Five times ten to the plus thirteen. So there's a lot of electrons in here. Yeah. Quite a lot. Quite a lot. So electrons. Electrons. Of course, removed or added, but we know very well that for this to be a positive charge we removed them electrons so we can say removed okay not a problem so this is how you do that six marks it's a bit of a situation trust me you get two marks correct substitution and the answer in the first one and using Pythagoras to get this one uh, maybe there or you can either say substitution but I think substitution at this point is pretty straightforward so we have four marks already. Ah, oh, he, matad anganes. I can It can't be like that. Anyway, hmm. The answer here, <laughs> the answer there, and getting this one. So maybe I'm giving too many marks. Let's just forget about this one. It is not so important. But I think this one was kind of cool to do that. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's the six marks on offer for this question. So I hope you guys were able to follow. I really apologize for my writing. It is not the best, I know. And what also kills me though is the position I have to assume to do this kind of video all right okay let's move on we have a lot of work still on this question so 7.2 says um, P is a variable point in an electric field of charged sphere A and R is the distance between point P and the center of the sphere A. See the diagram below. Okay, we can see there. Now it says a learner determines the magnitude of the electric field E at point P 
four different values of R. Sphere A is then placed, is then replaced by another sphere B of a different charge. Another set of results are obtained. Okay. Now it says the graph below are obtained from the results of for sphere A and sphere B. Now EA is the magnitude of the electric field at a distance of 0 0,04 meters from the center of charged sphere A. Okay, so now that is the story. So the distance here is 0, 0,04 meters. Great, from that charged sphere A, okay? So we can see the graph here. We can see the graph. All right, not a problem. So there's a graph for sphere B, there's a graph for sphere A, and this is sort of like ridged at that distance, okay? Now it says use the graph to answer the following questions, okay? Not a problem, we can handle that. So, um, how do we do that? So it says, state the proportionality between the magnitude of the electric field E at a point and 1 over R squared. Okay. Whew. 1 over R squared makes a direct proportion, isn't it? Yeah. So the, the one challenging thing is here, they are making this situation. We know that if this was the case, ish, I don't know how to explain this. Oh my God, remember electric field is going to be KQ over R squared, isn't it? So we say the distance itself, which is R, E is inversely related to R squared, sorry. But um, when it's 1 over R, it makes it a direct proportion. So, I don't know, man. Yay. I could, I could be combining, you know, things that don't mix together here. <laughs> but uh, I think I am answering the question right. So, because, I mean, look at this. 1 over r squared creates a straight line, so that's a direct proportion. But to r squared alone, not 1 over r squared, but to r squared, it's an inverse proportion. So I think um, they said use the graph as well as you know a guide so that you don't make a mistake. I think. 7.2 with 7.2.1, I would say it's direct proportion. Okay, it's a direct proportion or linear proportion because once you make 1 over r squared, you're creating a linear proportion. But if it was over r squared, you would have an inverse of that or a reciprocal of that, yeah. Because ideally it should do this. Because as the R increases, the, what is that, decreases. So now here it does the opposite because as you go further, R decreases in this case. Because 1 over whatever that is, is going to be much less than what would be the case here. So as we decrease this, we're increasing the electric field so this is a bit of a situation <laughs> one mark okay let's take it and smile so they decided to keep us confused a little bit so it's very easy to make mistakes here now it says calculate the electric field of a if the numerical value of the gradient of the graph for a is 6,80 okay so we know that the gradient is always a change in y over change in x, right? Right. So this implies what is our m here? Is 6,80 equal. So we're just going to use the graph. We're not going to do anything silly. 
So what is the change in Y? It is EA. Over change in X, this is just 1 over 0, 0,4 A, 0, 0,04 squared. Okay, so bit of a complicated thing there. So this is over 1, so obviously we cross multiply. Therefore our EA here is going to be equal to 680 Mm -hmm. multiply by 1 over 0, 0,04 squared okay so let's see what we get let's see what we get um, so let me start with this number because it's a little bit crazy uh, 0, 0,04 squared yeah this is strange such a big number are you serious eh 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 I can I don't trust it one I went a man soon call um, 0, 0,04 squared hey my energy levels are escaping me yeah it's the one times uh, six eight zero so I'm getting a very big number but usually this is what you would get right four hundred and twenty five thousand so four two five like that zero zero remember electric field is newtons per coulomb we no longer do, I don't know why you guys are not given the chance to experience the fun of the Millikan's experiment, which accelerates you know, an electron between two parallel plates, and there you would be talking about volts per meter because you're looking at the potential difference across those plates over the distance between them. Anyway, we're not there. Now, they wanted this value here, so we got it. We got it. So, um, I think identifying that substitution and the answer, in a way, gives us what we want. Yeah. yeah. So, I don't know why they're giving four marks here. Why are they giving four marks, really? Anyway, let's say the answer has two marks. Um, unless I'm missing something. But I don't think so. Alright, so 7.2.3. That was a bit easy. So it says now, how does the magnitude of the charge on sphere B, okay, compared to the magnitude of the charge on sphere A. Choose greater than, smaller than, or equal to. Give a reason for your answer. Now, look at this. Now, these things are very critical because you need to be able to understand a lot more. Sometimes working on graphs, I like it because it gives you a chance to interpret more of these things cause combining with your theoretical knowledge so what is the story here basically look um, this distance is greater than that okay basically because this is smaller than this right now remember for a greater distance to have a, a bigger electric field as we know that the electric field is directly proportional to the charge but it is inversely related to the square of the distance so now for a smaller distance because i mean i mean this is a bigger distance by the way 
because this one over makes this one even bigger because obviously let's say if it was a 0 0.02 div 1 divided by 0 0.02 is going to be smaller than this value over here so remember now what did we say again this distance is bigger than this distance okay so we're starting from big towards small that's what is happening here so this one is smaller than that so look at this for B for a greater distance we have the same electric field this one has to be shorter so obviously what does this tell us it tells us that the charge on B must be greater because the electric field will be greater with a bigger charge over a large distance isn't it yes so it is greater than so that is the answer so it is greater than so your explanation will be the electric field is directly proportional to the charge and so the EA of B is the same as the EA of A over a larger distance than in A. Okay, then for A, let's just say for A. Okay, so my little brief thingy here is it is greater than because the EA is directly proportional to the charge. And so the EA of B, okay, is the same as the EA of A over a longer distance than for A. I think that is the best way I can put it in short. So I guess you would get a mark for that and then of course you get two marks for that choice. So there we go. We take our 20 marks and we smile on. Alright, so that was a bit of a fun interpretation. So I hope you guys liked that one. Okay, so I'm not going to... Okay, let's do it. Oh Lord, why did I answer on the question paper? So we said greater than, okay? So we can just say uh, B achieved an electric field B achieved an electric field of the same magnitude as that for charge B, I mean for charge A over a much greater distance than A, okay? That's fine. So you get your two marks. Uh, okay, maybe two marks over there. And then one mark for that. I mean, you don't really have to provide a very long, lengthy explanation. And we're saying 20 marks. Thank you very much for going away with you. I don't know, guys. I feel like very, very, very tired. But we're going to move. I'm not going to give up, and so should you. You are not to give up, okay? Let's just race through these questions. It's tiring, I know. It's a lot tiring. But we've got to keep working. We've got to keep working. All right. Um... Let us see. Let us look see. <laughs> Let us have a jab at this one. Now question 8 says in the circuit below a battery of unknown EMF. Okay. Once it's unknown you know it's going to be a potential question. And an internal resistance of 0, 0,5 ohms. Okay. Not a problem. 
is connected to two resistors, 8 ohms and 8 ohms each. And a resistor R of unknown resistance, okay? Ignore the resistance of the connecting wires. Okay, so the connecting wires have a negligible resistance, all right? Great. We are okay right there. Not a problem. Um, what are we doing over here? Let me see. Let me see. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, now, let's see what is going on here. There is the battery. And then, of course, you know this is the positive terminal. And that's a negative terminal. So this long one is the positive. So the current flows in this direction. Remember a voltmeter is a high resistant resistor. So no such that very little amount of current would ever try to go there. So we assume that it doesn't go there. So it just flows to a lesser resistance. So it flows like that. Now with this switch opened, all the current, the total current passes through here, there, it goes there, and then it goes there, okay, and then back to the battery. Okay, so that is what is happening here. So these are in series with this switch open, but once this one is closed, then they're in parallel with this one. So that means the effective resistance in parallel will be much less than the two added together like that. So, um, so now, what do we know? What do we know? So it says now, the three external resistors are, these three external resistors are, uh, what you call ohmic conductors. The three external resistors are so-called three, I mean, they are so-called ohmic conductors. Yeah, ne? So now it says explain the meaning of the term ohmic conductor. Oh God, what is that? By the way, what is an ohm? But all I know is that it obeys the ohm's law, isn't it? <laughs> so, so I get these are some of the things you don't want to to mess with. So this is just easy. So you need to understand what is an ohmic conductor. Uh, so now, all of these things simply mean that. It talks about the the relationship between the resistance and the current okay and then of course uh, what what do I remember about that anyway what do I remember okay but I mean I think let's just say it obeys the Ohm's law and then of course the Ohm's law says the current between any two points on a conductor is directly proportional to the potential difference across these points, provided that the temperature of the conductor remains constant, okay? So, uh, now um, I'm trying to think uh, what would be the best way to put this statement forward. Rather than to be silly and just simply say it only obeys Ohm's law, what can I simply say to really put the message across? Um, uh, goodness. I don't know really. I mean, if we're going to talk about an ohmic conductor, all we know is that it is a conductor that has a resistance of 1 ohm when a current of one ampere passes through when a potential difference of one volt is maintained between the ends. So maybe let's go for just that explanation, I mean that more detailed one, rather than to be silly and lose unnecessary marks. Um, okay, let's just try, let me write it down so that at least you can have a look. 
But I, I'm sure your books do have a better explanation than I'm giving you guys. But anyway, let's just keep giving what we can give. <laughs> so 8.1 says, we're talking about an omic. Let me try and write nicely, conductor. Okay, we can just say it is a conductor. Okay, that has a resistance of one ohm, of one, okay, let's do it in words, of one ohm, all right, oops, kicked things here now. So we're saying an ohmic conductor is a conductor that has a resistance of one ohm, okay? When a current of one ampere, okay, ampere, but maybe I'm not right, yeah, it's ampere, I think. One ampere, uh, but this is ampere, guys. Uh, let's let's correct it. One ampere, um, okay, passes uh, through when a potential difference of one volt is maintained. Yo! Ay, 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 slung siya te tuan jeng ao man je. Maintained. Okay. Between its ends or terminals. All right. Ay, sas kulumi slung ke man je. Re bua se hua ba na bis. E bula bula slung. Hmm? What do you say in Chivenda? Hey, I only hear when they speak, you know. I struggle to say the words back. I don't know why. Yeah, anyway. So, Ibula Bula Shlungu. Yeah, Ibula Bula Shlungu. We're speaking English on Sprat Angels. Is it Angels? <laughs> yeah, whatever. Anyway, so, it says... I don't know, guys. I mean, try to see what your books. I mean, I'm singing here now because I'm, 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 you know, I'm becoming a mechanic now. I'm drawing it from a distance. So I'm gonna have to put it together nicely. It says, an ohmic conductor um, is a conductor that has a resistance of one ohm when a current of one ampere passes through when the potential difference of one volt is maintained between the ends, okay? All I'm saying is that it obeys Ohm's law, but I think you would not be given marks for just saying that. Please check in your books or whatever and see what is the story about an ohmic conduct. Maybe they would have a better explanation than this, but I don't think this one falls short anyway. So, let's just put it what do they say? Um, yeah, I, I put my head on the block and I, I assume I'm correct. Okay, I'm not assuming. I know I'm correct. So, yeah. I, you guys were tested though. They are really, really drilling you guys. Yeah, I mean, this looks simple, but they are actually not that simple. Anyway, it says now 8.2. When switch S is open, okay. So you can see there that our switch is open. Um, a voltmeter V1 reads, oh good, that's nice. So we're told here that V1, remember V1 is the potential difference maintained between the ends of this resistance and we were told this is an ohmic resistance, okay? Sorry, resistor or conductor. Um, so now, they say calculate the current through the battery. So we know for a fact that when this switch is opened, no current will pass through. 
the slower end so the total current passes there so it's very good because V according to Ohm's law we said remember it's an ohmic conductor it obeys Ohm's law which says you know ohmic conductor will have a resistance of 1 ohm when current that flows through it is 1 ampere when the potential difference of 1 volt is maintained across the ends so we can use that to our advantage now see that definition is quite cool man I'm more convinced it's right okay now it says the current uh, through the battery that means the total current basically and we can because we know that this resistance experiences the total current okay all right so 8.2.1 let's move let's move folks this is going to be uh, we know that V let's just say V1 equals IR okay so I don't know if I want to use I taught therefore I is going to be V1 over R which is going to be 3,2 divided by 4 so let's see what would be the total current over there 3,2 divided by 4 gives me 0, 0,8 amperes okay so that is let's just say therefore I taught well that's the total current maybe let's put it clear that this is the total current I taught equals 0, 0,8 amperes so that was easy not a big deal so usually you get your marks for the formula for the correct substitution and the answer 8.2.2 okay let's move we're spending too much time on this thing now it says calculate the emf of the battery okay so in any case um, the emf of the battery remember is going to be the total voltage of the external circuit plus the total voltage of the internal circuit that means the energy that will be dissipated by the internal resistance okay so well this is easy because we know that uh, emf equals the total current right multiplied by the total resistance of the external circuit plus the internal resistance i think that is that okay i'm not gonna stress myself let me just be sure though if this formula is correct sometimes it's easy to mess up so i don't want to struggle so do you see here we are good there it is hi weatherman Oops. there it is so i i'm happy with this one it makes life easy so you can do anything though that makes your life a bit easier but if it doesn't simplify your life stay away from it come on stay away from it because it's going to hurt you uh, i think i'm i'm taking too long and i should not it's dangerous so what is the total current is 0, 0,8 amperes now this one is going to be the sum of those two remember the switch s is open so it's going to be the sum of those two so it's going to be 4 plus 8 and then plus 0, 0,5 right which is going to be 0, 0,8 into let's deal with that big one so this is just going to be 12 plus 0, 0,5 which is 12,5 right times 0, 0,8 I get 10 so this is 12,5 anyway so this is going to be 10 let me check again 
12,5 times 0, 0,8. Always, guys, double check these things because it's easy to make a meal of the situation here. So, in any case, for the correct formula, I think this one is significant to show that you have to add those two. Alright, otherwise the correct substitution in general and the answer gives us the 4 marks on offer. Alright, but remember the marking guidelines are going to be published with the memorandums when they come so you'll be able to see exactly where the marks are. It's just an arbitrary way of thinking about it. So 8.3, let's not talk too much now. Now they are telling us switch S is closed and the voltmeter reads. Remember V2 is the external voltage. So it reads 8,8. ,8. Remember what was the EMF? It was 10. So now we are losing volts. Remember here we lost a very great amount of voltage. It went as far low as 3,2. Oh sorry, no, this was just V1. Okay, ah, making a mistake. So V2 reads 8,8, .8, so we've lost some volts now. Now it says calculate the resistance of resistor R. Okay, 5 marks. Okay, so that is a big, a bit of a big question, a bit of a hard hit, huh? So let's take another pen before this one dries up. Okay, so in any case, now with this switch closed, what we're going to experience is this effective resistance will decrease, okay? And as it decreases, at least they've given us the total voltage. And you know that the total current, we calculated it above is 0, 0,8, so we are fine. So we just simply use this voltage multiplied by the current for this one. So we know that according to Ohm's law, uh, according to Ohm's law, we just want the total voltage here. So the best, I mean the total current, I mean the total resistance of the V parallel. So we know here that V, let's just say used V2, is going to be I taught uh, multiplied by R parallel. We just want to know that the R parallel is going to be what here. This also implies now we have 8,8 .8 here equals 0, 0,8 times R parallel. Therefore our R parallel is going to be 8,8 .8 divided by 0, 0,8. Let's see what is that. Divide by 0, 0,8, I get 11 ohms, okay. So that's cool, so R parallel is definitely this one. So let's create some space here. But what do we know, 1 over R parallel equals 1 over this resistor R, which we don't know, because it's alone on the one side. But those two will add together as the top section. So plus 1 over 12, okay? You just add those two together. So that's what we know. Okay, all right. So what is R parallel? So we know that 1 over 11 equals 1 over R plus 1 over 12, okay? So, hmm. What are we going to do here? Look, if you want the LCM here, it's up to you. I mean, let's complicate it and say we want an LCM. The LCM is going to be 12 multiplied by 11 multiplied by R, okay? So it's 12 times 11. So it becomes 1, 3, 2, R. Okay, you multiply this all together, okay? Makes life easy. Then we multiply by the LCM throughout, okay? 
This will be such that when we multiply by that, so we know here we're going to have 12, right? Because 132 divided by 11, we get 12R, okay? Yeah, because we're multiplying by that over there equals, when we multiply by this here, all we're going to get is 132, okay? Because R will go plus, when we multiply by that over here, we'll get 11R, okay? So, if we solve for R, we just transpose that. Therefore, 12 minus 11 is just R equals 132 ohms. Okay, so I just wanted to play a bit of mathematics here. Otherwise, there's plenty ways you could do this. I mean, but life is easy, so I know this is 132. Okay, so that was five marks. Ah, my goodness. I'm wondering where is this five marks coming from anyway. Uh, uh, so let's just say that and that was kind of kind of good. Okay, maybe not here, but here. Correct substitution. And then again, correct substitution and the answer. That was four marks, so maybe for this statement it's quite cool. So we can say that is the five marks anyway. All right, um, that is fine. Hope you guys can see that. Hey, time is flying, man. Why are you flying time? Why? Now it says the battery becomes heated when V2 is replaced by a connecting wire. Remember connecting wire they said has a negligible resistance, okay? So meaning it's of low resistance, very low. Now it says explain this observation here. So what happens when we take out this high resistance voltmeter and we put in a connecting wire? Let's just say this is the wire that we're going to place here. All right, it can be this way, it can be that way, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, what we know is, because there is a resistance in the external circuit, right? Because of that resistance in the external circuit, what will happen is, um, always current or charge tries to go to an area of low resistance. So what will happen is as you're putting out the current, the most of the current will come back and come back to the battery like that. So you see we're going to short circuit basically this whole thing because what will happen is as charge was supposed to go that way it will actually flow back and back into the battery. And that actually increases the current. Even though this resistance is small, it increases the current that comes up here into the battery. And as you increase the current, you know what's going to happen. The lost volts will also increase and that is dissipated as heat in the battery. So it will be heated up. And even the wire will be very hot itself. So, um, this is all built from this thing here, that uh, power is I squared uh, R. Although R here for the internal resistance is small, let's just put that one. This is small, but because this is significantly increased by this cross circuiting here, I mean by this short circuiting here, so we know that this power will actually be essentially the heat dissipated by the lost volts or the internal resistance here. So, um, I don't know man, what are you going to say now? <laughs> Let's formulate the words. What story are we going to say? 
يعني آه إيش 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 Let's just say uh, um, how are we going to phrase this one? In fact, I don't even have space, so I'm going to have to write it here. So let's say here first off. Uh, the wire is essentially an extremely low ohmic resistor, okay? Okay? And will cause the current to short circuit to short circuit uh, back into the battery increasing significantly <laughs> yeah I can't just the deep alarm. Uh, increasing significantly the current through the battery and so increasing the uh, Increasing the energy dissipated by the battery as heat and the wire will be hot as well. Yeah, ne pali le ba fetu ni kule lagi. I get in the writing I'm hiking a seeing that. So it says the wire is essentially an extremely low ohmic resistor, okay? Meaning it does not dissipate any heat whatsoever or resistance and will cause the current to short circuit, okay? Backed into the battery, increasing significantly the current through the battery, and so increasing the energy dissipated by the battery as heat and also the wires will also be hot i think that is the little bit you can try to say but again like i explained that this is what is going to happen over here and this is essentially what is going to be the better equation to think about in explaining what is going on but in essence it just short circuits and when that happens the battery becomes very hot as well as the wire Okay, so that, guys, in essence, is the three marks, and that marks the 17 marks of this question. All right, so we're doing fine. Um, yo, I'm a little tired. I don't want to lie. But, but, work is work. Because Wafetu is cut. I see. So the little bit of time we find, we must use it. Okay, now we're on question nine, electrodynamics, okay. So it says, the simplified sketch of an electric motor is shown, okay. Motor, so that means we're going to use Fleming's left hand motor rule, if ever you are to determine stuff and movements here. Then we have this horseshoe magnet here. Okay, there's a pivot over there on which this whole coil is rotating. We don't really care in which direction it's rotating at this point, it seems. But all that is important is that there is a battery here. So it means we are using electrical energy to cause this to move. Think of your hair dryer. 
you'll need electricity to cause that thing to move and then you know to blow your hair and stuff like that all right so it says now write down the energy conversion that takes place in this motor of course the energy conversion is electric energy to mechanical energy okay but remember a generator is the opposite is mechanical energy to electrical so this one is from electrical to mechanical so there is your one mark in the back it says now um, is the motor above an AC motor or a DC motor remember once you see this split ring split ring or it's called a commutator okay then we know this is a DC motor okay again you get your one mark over there so what is the function of the commutator is to ensure the current flows in one direction okay it does not alternate like in an AC motor okay it is to ensure okay it is to ensure that the current flows in one direction okay that's all again very easy questions here so they decided to cool it off a bit you know yeah that's cool now it says a resistor y okay we're on another question so that's all i mean usually this question is pretty simple anyway so i could not even write on my page here at all so our question nine 9.1 is already sorted so we don't have to do anything here so it says now a resistor y is is rated to 120 volts and 100 watts and is connected to a 220 volt AC source so once we are given this one we know that is the so-called RMS voltage root mean square voltage so that is what we have here okay as shown in the circuit okay now there is the circuit is very simple it says now calculate the resistance of resistor Y not a problem so this one needs us to use power okay so we know that power this is the average power right equals uh, we want the resistance so power is what is V squared but this V is the RMS voltage over R okay I think there is a formula like that let's just be sure for a second yes there it is at the bottom that is the one so I think that is what we need to use here so this tells us if we make R the subject of the formula you just cross multiply then then divide by P so our R is going to be V squared RMS over P average so what is the V there is 220 that is squared by the way don't make the mistake of not squaring over 100 okay so we can take that down very easily so 220 squared divide by 100 what do we get I get 484 ohms okay that's all right so I get 484 ohms so uh, yeah now for the formula of course and for the substitution and for the answer we take our three marks and we say a whole lot of thank yous because I mean we feel like the pressure is down okay so it says now 
another resistor Z. Wow, my name starts with a Z, you know. So, <laughs> another resistor Z with a rating 220 volts. Okay. And X watts. Okay. Is now connected in series to resistor Y and to the same AC source. Now see the diagram. So now we see we have these two here. It says to us now the power dissipated by resistor Y changes to 80 watts. Okay, whatever. While its resistance remains constant, I mean it doesn't change, right? So it says calculate the power rating X of resistor Z, assuming that resistor Z has constant resistance. So we have to calculate the power rating of X. All right, so in any case here, all we need here is to use this power and this resistance that we know now because we calculated it above. We just want the current that passes through here. And the current should be the RMS current root mean square current okay so that is what we want over here once we get that current passing through it's gonna pass through this one as well as this one then we can use its volt and the current then we can find the power rating that's easy ne? looks easy at well it looks it looks easy very much easy hey what am I saying yeah well, yeah, 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 yeah. This is 9,2,1 here. Don't know why I'm writing things that don't make sense. This is 9.2 because we answered 9.1 on the question paper. So this is 9.2.2. So we know that, okay, for Y, things are looking like this power, remember, is... Um, the current in RMS squared R okay so that formula is there as well let's just have a look and be sure uh, hey guys I'm taking forever you know I don't like these long videos but they happen anyway they happen anyway so where is that? Where is it? Show your face thingy. Can't see you, you know. Yeah, ne? it's not in there. It's here. All right, so. Ooh, that is the word. Okay. So there we are. So this is power average. Okay, that's the average power. In any case, so why do we want to do this? Because we want the current. So I squared is going to be power average over the resistance. Therefore, our I in RMS, remember this is RMS, okay? Is going to be the square root of what? The power average over the resistance which is the square root of what is the power now they told us it's 80 over the resistance it's 484 okay great uh, so I'm going to have the square root of I win square root of 80 divide by 484 all right What do I get here? I get 0, 0,4, 0, 7. I'm going to keep it to three decimal places just to be on the safe side uh, because it's an intermediate step, so you don't want to round off too soon to two decimal places. Um, uh, amperes. Ampere. Okay, so that's not the answer, right? That was our means to an end. We can say, therefore, Z, 
All right, Zoro. You know the mask of Zoro. Yeah, that movie was cool, man. I enjoyed it a lot. And also the so-called The Legend of Zoro. Ah, that kid was awesome. Anyway, we're not talking about movies now. So for that, what do we know? We know that we want the average power is going to be equal to. Now, what do we know? We know the voltage, right? We know the voltage. So this is going to be V RMS multiplied by the current RMS, okay? Because I don't see any other way we can deal with this one, you know? Yeah, I really don't see. Uh, so we can say therefore, what was that? The power rating was X, so therefore X is equal to the voltage they told us is 220 um, multiplied by 0 0.407. So what do we get? Let's see on our calculator. 220 multiplied by 0 0.407. And I get 89,54. That's watts. Or watts. Is it watts or watts? Is it watts or watts? Okay. Ah, Murenaka. Eh, Bahala, the Lotena. Eh, the Tatania. Wow, wow, wow. Alright, so that is what I am getting, friends. I hope I did the right thing here. Because sometimes some things just, you know, have a tendency to go wrong. Uh, so that's what I'm getting. Okay. Get on that ew. Get on that ew. All right. So I think we have done this one. So I don't know why it's six marks really. It surprises me, you know. This one. And then maybe two marks here for taking the square root. I really don't know about it. Why? Yo. Okay, maybe three marks, not two. Come on, man. This formula, substitution, answer. Formula, substitution, answer. Six marks. But I kind of feel funny about this one. Uh, but I don't think it's too bad also. I mean, these are very easy questions, to be honest. They're not meant to be difficult at all, so... Yeah, yeah, but double check, double check, double check. So let's just say for this one as well, please have a look. Maybe bounce it amongst yourselves as well. Maybe check in your guidelines, your books, whatsoever, your teachers and stuff, and then check those memos as well when they come out. And don't be afraid to let me know if I have made any errors because, I mean, Errors always find a way of just showing up. And as annoying as they are, they're just a part of our lives, whether we like it or not. But the good thing is, if we recognize them, that is, a, that is good. Because we can make up for them, isn't it? But if we don't see them, then they hurt us when we don't expect them to. So please, guys, if you see something wrong, please let me know or you have a better suggestion about something maybe something that is a bit easier and maybe more direct please share it as well because these things help you know other people to learn better so that they don't feel like this is overwhelming when it looks long and tiring 
maybe a shorter version of it may make it sound a bit nicer and maybe a bit more palatable all right um let us move on guys to the last question uh before we start passing out so i don't know i feel like i have done two hours already here but either way these things are long I don't know how you guys manage the three hours with these long papers. But anyway, we wrote 10 questions too. So, <laughs> I don't know. Feels like it's impossible now. But never felt impossible back then. Ah, not a big deal. All right, let's see. Question 10 says... Um, the apparatus illustrated in the simplified diagram below is used to demonstrate the photoelectric effect. Okay. Photoelectric effect. Okay. I think I'm tasty. Let me just drink quickly and come back. I will take too long. Oh. Yes, yes, yes. Ah. Right, so I am back. So we want to deal with our photoelectric effect. Photoelectric effect. Is it effect? <laughs> or effect? Yeah, whatever you want to say. All we know is we are just going to do this one just right. Okay, so the question is uh, what? What? What's the question, man? The question says fine as we know here by the way just be able to play around this thing sometimes play some some play okay some okay i don't know but this thing is called the cathode in this kind of a thing okay the cathode is what emits the electrons and then this one is the anode Already you're talking about, you know, a bit of what you would see in chemistry. Ah, yes. So, please know these things. They're quite dynamic, you know. So, this is the negative terminal. And it's called the cathode. This is the positive terminal. Remember, electrons are negatively charged. So, they'll be attracted by the positive terminal. And, of course, this is the vacuum tube. How do you write vacuum? Is it double C or is it ah uh, heaven? Where's Allah? I I guess I wanna hungola vacuum. I guess I know kwala a vacuum heaven. Ah, ora 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 This is the vacuum tube. Hey, buffet rang angas na mangas. Let na get a baby. And it's TV, and TV, and TV seal. What I'm gonna do? And TV, and TV. Yeah, whatever, man. It's difficult, it's difficult, but you know, sometimes it's nice to just take a bit of a breather. Sometimes when I talk nonsense, just know I'm trying to relieve the pressure on my brain. It's starting to build up now. Okay, so this is the vacuum tube where these electrons can move into that and then of course as electrons do that then there will be an electric current oops doing that all right so let us see it says now um 
de define the term photoelectric effect again easy marks okay come on guys can't fail this thing what is the photoelectric effect okay let's just do this question and stop this nonsense once and for all so question 10 so this is 10.1 10.1.1 okay so it says define the term photoelectric effect okay so what do we know let's just write the word photo yeah ne? electric now I'm really okay what is this defined as this is a phenomenon a phenomenon okay phenomenon give phenomenon that what is the phenomenon this is the phenomenon of light okay of light okay of a certain frequency sometimes some people say enough so certain frequency but this frequency must be enough okay uh, this is a phenomenon of light of a certain frequency uh, ejecting electrons from the surface of materials. Just say materiale because you don't know what is this. Could be a plate could be an atom could be you know whatever you say just I think materials covers everything or you say substances doesn't really matter so the photoelectric effect basically is the phenomenon of light of a certain frequency this frequency is not specific right but it has to be enough okay because if it is not enough it won't do it so some people say light of enough frequency to eject electrons from the surface of my Materials. So this is an easy two marks. Again, guys, this is something to take and never look back, okay? So this is what you really want to do. Kill this thing. You know what? Kill it. Just kill it, all right? Thank you very much. I thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Is it Madam Speaker or Mr. Speaker? Anyway, Madam Speaker. Now it says the incident light, we are told the frequency of this light is 1,2 times 10 to the 15 hertz as shown, okay, is shown onto the metal plate, okay, that is that light over there, and electrons are emitted. So if electrons are emitted, it means this light, the photons of this light have an energy greater than the work function of this cathode. Now the question says calculate the number of photoelectrons emitted in one second if the total energy transferred by the light to the metal plate per second is that. Okay, so per second we have this. So, well, 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 what? Let's hear this one. Total energy transferred. Okay, now we need the photoelectric equation, right? Right, right, right. So now we have a problem though. Number of electrons, where's my blue thing? Okay. So now, what is the story here? This is even navy, it's not green, or is it white, magenta? I don't know what this color is anyway. Anyway, remember the number of photoelectrons. Now remember when the light, let's just think about it for a second here. When light comes, right, it has these packets of, of energy, which is called a photon, right? And we know that each photon will uh, pass its energy to only one electron 
all right so that is the most important thing so what we need here first of all we now have the total amount of energy so they're telling us that the total amount of energy is this one so well we know that okay but this energy total is made up of photons that interacted with just one electron so if we have this then how much is an energy of a photon because that way we can divide this energy over the energy of a photon and that will tell us exactly how many electrons we got because each photon will transfer its energy to only one electron and in total we will have this much energy transferred okay so this is something like that so it's a bit of a challenging question to figure out but if you understand a bit of the concept which is why sometimes you know these are the parts of your book where you just read and you probably don't pay so much attention so sometimes to read the details of your materials helps a lot because when you get questions like these hmm, you feel like a king but at times these questions are very 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 challenging because they shake your confidence to some extent i also feel a little bit shook because i thinking about this one photoelectrons but we have never really seen a calculation of photoelectrons but hey knowing though that each photon interacts with only one electron so this energy in total per second we can then calculate the energy of each photon and divide by this then we'll know how many photons were transferred and that will also tell us the number of electrons indirectly all right fine here's what we know we know that the energy of a photon okay let's just think of a photon energy of a photon is given by the Planck's constant multiplied by the frequency of the incident light now Planck's constant is 6,63 times 10 to the minus 34 of course try to cram these if you can they are very important so what was the frequency of the incident light it's 1,2 times 10 to the 15 so let's see how much energy does each photon contain so 6,63 to the minus 34 multiplied by 1,2 to the 10 I mean to the 13 is it 13 mm, it's to the 15 almost wrote my own thing there okay to the 15 so I get 7 comma let's just write it as it appears 956 times 10 to the minus 19 joules okay that is the energy of just one photon okay spare that my writing is deteriorating so but now we know that the total energy transferred so now therefore this follows that the number of photons is going to be equal to the energy total transferred over the energy of a photon right so the energy transferred they're telling us that it's 1,75 to the minus 9 and you can see minus 9 is greater than minus 19 okay so this is 1,75 times 10 to the minus 9 joules over the energy of just one photon is 7,956 times 10 to the minus 19 okay let us see what we get 1,75 to the minus 9 divided by 7,956 to the minus 19. Yo, 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 yo. That's a lot of photons there. So I'm just going to write to 1, 9, comma, and uh, let's do 9, 5. 
times 10 to there. Now let's count. 1, 2, 3. So it displaced this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So it's going to be to the 7. Sometimes we can push all of these others as well. So it's up to you what you do. Let me check again. What did I push? I pushed 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that is the situation here. So this is the number of photons. Okay. Now, what do we know? We know that one photon interacts with one electron. Therefore, the number of electrons is going to be the same. 219, comma, 96 times 10 to the 7. Uh, uh, electrons. Why do I know it's going to be exactly the same? Because this energy of these photons, because they, they were of the good frequency, so definitely the amount of energy transferred will reflect exactly the number of electrons that were excited and, you know, emitted. So it's a bit of an indirect type of a question. But again, please have a look when that memo comes out. Again, this is where you're not so sure, but you try and combine what makes sense to find your way. So what matters is the approach, guys. And approach will always be better with knowledge. But if you know less, yeah, it becomes a bit of a situation. So they're giving five marks, four marks there. Hmm. Okay, so I guess finding the energy of a photon is most important. And finding the number of photons that were transferred by this light is another mark. And then, of course, uh, this one situation here, I think, warrants some mark. One photon interacts with one electron, therefore the number of electrons is that one so maybe for that whole statement you get a mark so we have three marks here so maybe for that i don't know man sometimes the marks are not very easy to tell where they come from that's if we are correct though okay we still stand a chance of being wrong on this one but i think this is the best way to figure it out but we will let them correct us later on or it's So Shuma Dero in Tiro Yatir. Yeah, it relegas. When I bash quam. Anyway, let's not talk enough nonsense. Uh, I don't even know what I'm saying now. I'm so tired. I'm so sleepy. I feel like I'm dreaming right now. So please, guys, if I'm saying something that is stupid, just know. I can't feel my face. <laughs> I cannot. So that is fine. Um, I think this is cool. I don't think there's any better way to figure this one out. But again, it, it would be nice to see what would be the proposed answer and in fact how they go about it as well. Anyway, so let's just finish this thing now. 10.1.3 says... Um, Maximum speed of a photoelectron if the threshold frequency of the metal plate is. Okay, so now they're giving us the threshold frequency. You know that the threshold frequency gives us the work function of that plate. Uh, 
uh, that's fine and of a photoelectron so we're just going to focus on just one photoelectron so that means we are going to focus also on the energy of just one photon not that total energy so this one don't touch it but what we calculated okay so this is easy again takes us back to the photoelectric equation so let's just put this one aside and get this question sorted okay let's not take forever now I think two hours is over so we should not go beyond this one so 10.1.3 so all I know is that energy but remember now is going to be equal to the work function plus ek max right because when a photon transfers energy first of all part of its energy sort of like deals with the work function of that uh, material and then whatever else is left is going to be the maximum kinetic energy okay so now here we're talking about the energy of a photon okay so i mean we calculated the energy of a photon so there it is so i'm not going to stress myself and start going backward so you could still do it in case you think you made a mistake or so but i trust myself on this one so the energy of my photon here okay let's just first deal with this one nice and easy so this is the photon right let's just say photon to make it clear so this implies what that my 7,956 times 10 to the minus 19 equals the work function is the Planck's constant which is 6,63 uh, times 10 to the minus 34 now this is going to be multiplied by the frequency threshold frequency so the threshold frequency they are giving us here is 9 comma don't do it. so this is 9 comma 0 9 um, times 10 to the 14 okay 10 to the 14 uh, I don't know man why this thing is looking like that I yeah 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 I will black them this thing now why is it doing this to me 7 comma 9 5 6 times 10 to the minus 19 I'm really jumping in guys so I'm sorry if I'm too quick so this work function is going to be Planck's constant 6 comma 6 3 multiplied by 10 to the minus 34 multiplied by the threshold frequency which is going to be 9 comma 0 9 times 10 to the 14 okay that's what they gave us so that whole thing makes up the work function okay plus ek max let's just keep it at that for now so this is the photoelectric equation put together nicely so we already calculated this one above so that's why i'm just plugging it in this implies that my ek max right that's what i want isn't it um ek max is going to be equal to this one seven comma nine five six times ten to the minus nineteen minus let's see what that is um so this is six comma six three to the minus thirty four times nine comma zero nine to the 14 mm. so this one is actually small indeed okay this is good because 7 is bigger than 6 so this is 6 comma 0 3 let's make it okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. let's just say 2 it's not round off too soon so 0 comma 27 times 10 to the minus 19 okay 
All right, which is what? So let us see what is the story here. So now we have seven comma nine five six to the minus nineteen minus six comma zero two seven to the minus nineteen. So all I have is one comma nine two nine times ten to the minus nineteen. Okay. So this is joules, okay? Great. Now, that is the kinetic energy, okay, EK max. But this also implies that half mv squared equals 1,929 times 10 to the minus 19. So this is a bit of a longish one. And if we divide by half m throughout, what do we get? We get that our v squared is going to be equal to 1,929 times 10 to the minus 19 all over. Now m will remain here at the bottom, right? But 2 will multiply the numerator. so. We're going to have something like that, okay? Two goes to the top and m to the bottom. But now what is v? Therefore v because they want the velocity. V is going to be the square root of two into one comma nine two nine times ten to the minus nineteen all over m is the mass of an electron. So let's check what is that mass of an electron. The charge, not the charge, mass of an electron is 9,11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Okay, it's very small mass. All right, so we are good. So we are ready to do this thing now, okay. So take the square root of two into one comma nine two nine to the minus 19, okay. All of that over nine comma one one to the minus 31. Yo, yeah, ne. This thing is moving. Look at that speed. It's crazy, man. So this is uh, 6507.61,61 meters per second. Yeah. I have never seen a thing like that in my life. Whew. I hope this is correct, but yeah, it looks all right. Let me just say this one, uh, 1, 929 EXP minus 19, divide by 0, 0,5. I get that, and then that divide by 9,11 uh, to the minus 31. I get that, and then I take the square root of the answer. Yeah, it's the same thing, okay? So I think that's all right. So sometimes you get strange numbers. I mean, we're so used to calculating very easy numbers like 50, 120, but can you see this one <laughs> is like a crazy speed, I tell you. This is 650,761,61 meters per second. That is like a manga speed. All right, guys, so I think this one was cool also. So the five marks here, because I mean, we calculated that. So I think the mark is over here. Of course, the formula, photoelectric formula. And getting the EK max, all right? 
and then getting here and the answer so that should be the five marks again these marking guidelines I'm providing here are arbitrary in nature so do not at all attach too much to them but I'm just trying to highlight some areas that if you do right you can you know get something out of it all right guys and uh, let's focus on to our last question uh, our last question is all about um, so um, is all about emission spectrum so remember there's what we call absorption spectrum and an emission spectrum okay so what do we know about an emission spectrum so it says briefly explain how an emission spectrum is formed in terms of energy transitions so basically when you want to emit remember that means an atom is coming from an excited state or a high energy state to a lower energy state usually let's say ground level state so when that happens the energy is emitted so it's coming from high to low so it's a very simple thing here so how are you going to write the statement here let's just write it on the paper because I can't so we can just say an emission spectrum um, is formed when an atom okay in an excited excited okay it's very happy this one okay it's high energy so it is this spectrum is formed okay these statements are reading like this emission spectrum is formed when an atom in an excited uh, okay energy level or let's just say excited level okay let's just say an, an excited or high energy level okay uh, now what happens an atom in an excited energy level uh, is uh, what can we say now as long as you are a foot see who I can see what is in briefly explain an emission okay we're saying now this is formed when an atom moves from yeah, when an atom okay when an atom in an excited energy level is let's just let's just say moved to a low energy level okay you can just say ground state if you mean okay that's all I mean energy is emitted when you're moving from high to low I think that is enough let's not complicate our lives so it is formed when an atom in an excited energy level is moved to a low energy level state or ground state basically that's fine all right guys so that sums the 150 marks that i hope you guys got if you didn't get 150 it's fine you will still get that distinction so if you didn't get it try again don't give up all right guys so this is how far i could attempt to answer your physical science paper one for may june 2021
2022 supplementary exams. So this is a national paper, so it was written all over the country. Uh, but your June exams, if you are the new class of metric 2022, your March exams or first term and media exams, maybe trial, I think, those are local papers, not local, but provincial papers, I think, yeah. Uh, the only paper that is national is your finals. Your finals, you write one single paper, as well as the supplementary paper, I think so. But I'm not too sure about that trial paper. Let me not say the trial is, but from my observations, they look like, they look like, but I'm not too sure. And let me not go there anyway. So that is it, guys. Uh, thank you for watching and thank you for your patience. And I know I took forever again and I did not plan to, but I'm very tired and very sleepy. So I kept myself in check. I had to try and maintain the focus, although it was really slowly running away from me. Uh, otherwise, guys, if you enjoyed the video, please don't hesitate to share it with your friends so that they too can have a look and see how they did. And those who are still to do, they can see how it's done. And of course, um, if you meet any question that you find interesting and you need a second look into, don't hesitate to run it past me. You have my email address on the channel here. So you can just email me those questions and we can see what I can do about it. Otherwise, I'll just keep dropping some of these nice questions every now and then so that you guys can, you know, remain in that excited state until the very end so that you can just cool off in December when all is done and dusted and prepare for your careers that are kick-started elsewhere when you finish your matric. All right, guys, thank you again for watching and thank you again for your subscriptions. I can see they're increasing. And thank you for sharing the video, uh, the videos as well, because I can see also the viewerships are also exponentially growing. So you guys are doing your part. And yes, yes, we're going closer and closer to that competition of ours, because I think at this point, uh, I've given you pretty much what is necessary for grade 12 metric uh, physical science and mathematics because look as much as I didn't really give you any sort of lessons on physical science be it physics or chemistry but I think doing all the papers the way that I have probably should give you a bit of an idea of how I work these things out and maybe you can just compare and contrast with your method and see if it takes you across or it makes your method even stronger or whatever it does man whatever it does I just hope it's a good one though if it is not let me know because I'm willing to do my best to give you what will eventually work for you I really want to simplify your life and do a part of the work that you're supposed to do so that at least you can use your intelligence to excel. All right. All right, guys. Bye-bye. Uh, and I will see you guys on the next video, which will be paper two. Okay. So I'll probably we'll also split it into two sections, part one and part two. And then see how it goes. I hope I would be able to do it before you guys actually write your paper too as well so that at least you will have enough to work with. All right, guys, cheers and good luck with your exams and I hope you do very good and you make yourselves and your parents, your schools, including me, very proud. Bye-bye.